Hey everyone, so in this video I'm going to be breaking down um, the first movement of the symphony that I wrote last year. It was my very first symphony and I'm really excited to sort of get to talk about it with all of you. If you haven't listened to the symphony yet, um, then there should be a link floating somewhere around on the screen. Um, and there should definitely be one in the description, so go ahead and listen to it if you haven't already. And for those of you who already have, thank you so much for taking the time to hear it. Um, I'm very proud of it, even though it's certainly not perfect and has a lot of problems, but I'm excited to talk about it uh, one way or another. So um, there's not a clear story for the symphony. There is sort of a setting. I have it, it, the backdrop is kind of like uh, late 17th century, um, so that's like the golden age of piracy. So even though pirates don't actually factor into the symphony until the fourth movement, um, which I'll discuss in a later video, there's still sort of that backdrop of piracy happening here. So you know, it sort of lends itself to a sort of an adventurous spirit, even when the pirates aren't sort of at the front of things. So right now, if you look at this, you can see right off the bat, so full orchestra in, pretty much right at the beginning. You may also be able to see, let's see if I can zoom in, sweet, okay. You may also notice a time signature, it's in 12-8. So 12-8, if you're not familiar with it, can look kind of alarming at first. It's really just 4-4, four, four, but with a triplet feel instead of an eighth note feel. So instead of 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and, it's triplet, 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 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and. It has more forward motion, more rhythmic drive, which I think is important for sort of a swashbuckly style piece. Um, I happen to just really love 12-8 as well. I, I write in it a lot, especially for exciting pieces. Um, but most of my music tends to have a triplet feel. I just like it a lot. Maybe it's because I'm like young and full of energy and I like the forward motion and maybe when I'm older I'll be super into like 4-2 or something. Um, <laughs> but right now I just love 12-8. So I, I don't waste any time building up immediately. It's just big forte. Uh, down here you've got the bass drum. Okay, okay, I'm circling things. I'm not sure if that's helpful or not. Um, but I'm, I'm circling things because I can. I've um, got the timpani, but other than that, that's the only bass that you hear right at the beginning. The first measure is all treble. So you've got the woodwinds up here, trilling away. Should I circle them? I'll circle them. They're trilling away. Um, and then you've got the triangle here, and crash cymbal, and then these cascading harp. Um, and just for one measure, but then the second measure, we get the seafaring theme, and it's played with you know, glorious lower brass and winds. So you do get that sort of resonant um, sound here. So yeah, so this is the seafaring theme, or at least the first portion of it here. I will circle that because I can. Um, the seafaring theme is probably the most important melody in the symphony. It's one of only two melodies that are used in every single movement. The inspiration for the seafaring theme um, is definitely like Eric Wolfgang Korngold. That's kind of who I was trying to emulate with this. Um, you can kind of tell um, the way it's um, presented here. It's all done, you know, with lower brass and stuff. It's like a pentatonic melody. It's just supposed to sort of recall that sort of swashbuckly Korngold sound. So you get the first part of that here. Um, this part of the melody, and it's going to be repeated here, um, slightly. This is all part of the A section of this theme. There is a B section, although you only hear it a few times in the symphony. Most of the time, only the A section is uh, referenced. So anyway, so you've got this theme going on here. Um, then right after that theme plays, the strings start to kick in here with this sort of um, triplet motion. And then suddenly the strings are joining the woodwinds in their sort of trilling motion. Um, and then we get the next part of the theme here, again with the same instrumentation. Um, immediately after they perform that theme, we get the next motif, which is the fanfare motif. I mean, it's actually two measures, so this is the first measure, and if I were to scroll down, there's the second half of that theme. Um, it's mostly played by trumpet, um, but trombones help for those lower notes that are um, would sound kind of flabby if the trumpets were going to do a triad with the E on top. Um, so the trombones are just kind of helping out. And But this is the other motif, or the other theme. I'm calling it a motif because it's so short but it's the only other uh, musical identity that shows up in every single movement. Although even though it's only two measures, uh, the second measure I don't think is ever referenced again after the first movement. Uh, I think it's just the first measure that's ever uh, utilized in the other movements. While the upper strings are trilling, I've got the lower strings pitzing down here. Just sort of adds this sort of light feel. Because this isn't heavy yet. This is supposed to be just sort of exciting and happy, but without having too much drive at the moment. 
So after the fanfare stuff happens, we have this motif, which I, I'm kind of calling it the anticipation motif, but it's basically transitional material, getting me out of the key I'm currently in, A major, into C major, which I'm going to use to present the next theme. So it's just these kind of chirpy woodwinds. I mean, chirpy might be the wrong word because these aren't upper woodwinds. You know, it's bassoon, clarinet, oboe. They're all kind of in a pretty comfortable range. You know, with the flute doing this very chirpy thing up here, um, which that motion is then repeated down here in the glock, um, or the glockenspiel. We've shifted a little bit because this, remember, this was the key of A major, but we're utilizing the flat six here. So this is um, it's an F major over A, I think. The lovely thing about the flat six, which is one of my favorite chords, um, is that it's really, really nice. Well, the flat six is extremely useful. It's one of the most useful chords. It builds excitement. It just sounds so cool. Um, but it also is really, really helpful for modulating. So since I'm wanting to modulate to C major, I'm using the flat six of A major, which is F, which also happens to be the four in the key of C. So since they share this chord, um, I can use it to sort of move between them. Yes, yeah, so we get this sort of bouncy theme happening here. And again, the orchestration is still, even though there's a lot of instruments in, it's still pretty light. We just got these sort of plucked things in the bass. All the treble stuff is trilling. It's just very, very light. It's not heavy at all. And then we move from that F major chord to the G here, and we get this um, another fanfare idea that pops in real quick. And then uh, I guess this is part of the fanfare. Um, and then that moves us right into the next portion of the symphony. <laughs> moves us into C major and the freedom theme. So I'm introducing a lot of ideas really, really quickly. Um, but that's just so that I, now that I've introduced them all, have had this really quick exposition, I can now sort of start to play with these themes throughout the movement. Um, but first, this is the introduction of the freedom theme. And actually, before the theme comes in, because it's played here on trumpet, um, we have, there's this sort of piccolo jig that happens. Um, and it keeps going even when the freedom theme kicks in, and it works sort of as counterpoint. Um, but it's not the only contrapuntal sort of element that's happening here. There's also this um, thing that happens with the violas and the celli, um, where it also gets sort of a counterpoint melody as well. Um, sometimes it's really easy for me and for many composers just to write in these sort of string pads, like I have in the violins, where they're just sitting on whole notes, basically, or occasionally a half note. Um, but I, I like sort of having these contrapuntal ideas whenever I can. It just makes the whole tapestry feel so much richer. Um, it's a little challenging to do sometimes because if you have too much motion, then it becomes distracting and confusing or muddy or all of these things. So you have to be careful and you have to be tasteful. Sometimes it's really exciting to write all these independent lines, but if they don't really form into a cohesive whole, the music is way less effective than it would have been if you just kept it simple. In this case, though, I think I do toe the line um, between being too... Um, between too much activity and it's uh, being you know fairly simple at the same time. It's, it's kind of both. But yeah, so this trumpet theme kicks in here, the freedom theme, and I call it the freedom theme because this is sort of supposed to represent um, that sort of feeling of being on the open sea, awaiting adventure, and being away from everything that's behind you. You know, you're moving forward to a new place, there's nothing in your way, it's just open sea wherever you look. As you would expect for then a theme called the freedom theme, it's a very chipper melody, um, very optimistic, very upbeat. Um, you know, I have it in C major, which is such a cheerful, optimistic key. Um, I have it in that key for a reason. I have it on just that solo trumpet because, again, you get a nice, bright, optimistic sound here. Um, and the string bed underneath, um, even with that contrapuntal thing in the viola and the cello, it's very relaxed. It's meant to sort of be like the sea. It's sort of supposed to give you the sort of oceany feel. Um, it's, this is sort of, I mean, I'm going to talk a lot about film music inspiration throughout this, since that's what I'm most well versed in. And the, certainly the symphony sounds more like film music than classical music. Um, but this also pulls from video game music as well. I would butcher their names if I tried to say the names of the composers I'm thinking of. Um, but the music for, like, The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, when you get sort of the, the Great Sea theme, that's sort of what I'm thinking here with the string stuff. Even though it doesn't sound too much like it, I have the same sort of idea where I just want to be able to emulate the ocean, but with the strings, and then have this other stuff happen on top of it, which isn't ocean-related. It's more like what the characters might be thinking as they're traveling on the sea. I'm kind of over-intellectualizing it a little bit. <laughs> when I write music, it's a lot more just intuitive, but when I try to explain where my intuitions come from, it sounds like I'm thinking about a lot, but really I'm not. This, I was just like, okay, string bed here, and then things are going to happen on top of it.
After that first performance of the freedom theme, it's repeated here, but with horns and trombone now taking over. I mostly want the horn color, but the trombones are going to help give it a little bit more volume um, without impeding on the color too much. While they're doing that, and all the string stuff is the same, I have the woodwinds kicking in. Um, the piccolo jig is done, but I have the flute, oboe, and clarinet actually performing the seafaring theme and counterpoint. It's a little bit simplified so that it doesn't distract as much, but it is still very much the seafaring melody. And this is just so that there is just something else going on here and not just the freedom theme and the string stuff below. Because once you lose the pick element up here, then all of a sudden there's this empty space because you're used to hearing all these things happening at once. So to fill in that space, I just put in this counterpoint line. Um, and it works really well because obviously the freedom is being associated with the idea of seafaring. So it makes sense to have this in counterpoint with this theme. It's all working towards a common goal. After this performance of the freedom theme, um, then there's this, which is, you could potentially analyze this as the B section of the freedom theme. Um, sometimes I think about it that way, it's all, but it's more just functioning as transitional material. Um, because you know it really doesn't have that much to do with the freedom theme, it just happens to follow it here, and it usually follows it when this um, shows up. But it really doesn't have that much in common with it, I don't think, rhythmically, and certainly not melodically. So, because we're going to be moving back into A major, so I wanted to find a way to modulate naturally into that. So I give the solo oboe line, it gets way quieter here, because um, it's just, you know, we've got pits in the bass strings. Violin 1 is the only um, other string group playing at first. They're just tremoloing, they're really quiet, um, they're dividing up. So that violin one section is being split up into three different groups, so you're going to get this fairly delicate sound here. They're just tremoloing these string chords. When it repeats, it's sort of beefed up a little bit. You've got more pits going now, and a bassoon joins the oboe in its upper registers, which is nice because it gives you sort of this delicate sound. So I use this stuff to modulate um, into A major. So now we're back to the seafaring melody, and it's up here in the winds, but there's some a lot of motion happening underneath it. There's this line shared by the bassoon and the viola, and it's, it's this very rhythmic idea. That dun -da -da, I'm gonna try to sing it. Dun -da 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 -dun -da -dun That's what the rhythm is, and then the cello and the bass down here are doing a different rhythm. Dun dun da 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 dun 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 da 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 dun. So there's a lot of drive happening here. One of my favorite moments of this uh, movement also happens over here, just these two measures where the horn and the trombone uh, join in with the bassoons and the viola on that rhythm. And it just gives it this cool little seafaring swashbuckling feel. It's, it's, I like the way that ended up sounding. And again, I'm using the trombone the same way I did earlier to sort of give the horns a little bit more power without taking away from their sound. So I've had two fairly carefully set up modulations, but I follow this here with an immediate modulation from A major to F major. So if you remember before, when I was wanting to get out of A major, I used the F major chord to move myself to C, because it's the flat 6. But here I use it as a direct modulation, which I think is cool, because one of the things that the flat 6 does is it sort of gives a sort of energy to the melody. It energizes it. So if you're going to do an immediate modulation, one cool way to do it is to go to the flat 6, because it immediately gives you a little bit of an energy boost. So here we have the seafaring melody again. Obviously now it's an F major, because we modulated. Um, but it's not being played by the winds anymore. The winds are just trilling up above. Instead it's given to the trumpets, and it's given this fairly daring sort of rhythmic idea. With the trombones down here helping out again when it gets to lower notes. And this, I think, feels very swashbuckling, at least to my ears. Uh, it, it feels very exciting, I think. And again, it, there's no bass here except for just this bass drum that's happening right there. Um, so it's very treble heavy. So Because it's, it's made it feel very, very light. It's adventurous, but it's not big and grand yet. It's just very sort of exciting. Got some string motion here, which you may remember was used at the very beginning when the strings initially entered. Um, so I'm just bringing back this motion for this part, sort of recalling the excitement at the very opening. Um, and then I sort of use these strings to modulate 
and get us into the new key of A flat major. Um, and I'm going to be bouncing between F major and A flat major for a little bit. Um, it just worked out nicely that way. Um, so we're at the seafaring melody again, and again it's on trumpet, but there's a difference. It's just a solo trumpet, and it's a lot more solemn. I've brought the tempo down, I've relaxed it quite a bit, and we've got this bed of strings underneath it. The bass isn't in for the first two measures, but it kicks in here, but we still got the cello, so there's still sort of a resonant sound happening there. Um, I've got the French horn doing these. They're not really counterpoint lines, they're really more like fills, uh, sort of just filling in this empty space here. Um, I really try very, very hard to fill in whatever empty space there is, as I'm sure you've possibly already noticed, just like here with the strings um, and the triangle actually here as well. Um, not to go back and forth so much, but that's just something I like to do, just fill in whatever empty space there is. I don't like to think of listeners being bored. <laughs> um, so I try to make sure there's always something going on, um, unless it's imperative that there is empty space. Like, for instance, where we're about to go. So here the solemn idea breaks down even further to just string quartet. Just violin 1, 2, viola, and cello. Um, so it gets quite intimate here, the tempo slows down even more, but it's still playing the seafaring melody, that's still the melody happening here. And here it's a lot more sparse. This, there's certainly a tradition in string quartet writing to be intensely contrapuntal and intellectual, but that's not what I've done here. Other than the melody in the first violin, everyone else is really just playing whole notes or dotted half notes. And that's just because I want this to be much more simple and much more modest. So this is where these kind of spaces that happen actually do serve a dramatic purpose because they're just sort of supposed to be a modesty and a calm about this section. Um, I would have been, I think, counterintuitive to have written anything more complicated than this. So we go from one very small ensemble to another very small ensemble right here, where now we've got the seafaring melody played by a woodwind quintet. You've got your flute, your oboe, your clarinet, your bassoon, and then the horn kicks in here in the back half of uh, the performance of this theme. But then after that, the full orchestra is back in to do sort of this big dramatic sounding uh, variation on the seafaring theme. And then there's this very surprising dissonant chord here. And this leads us then right into this next section. So the big dissonant chord has a bunch of instruments on it, brass and strings, just hushes to the upper strings, get this nice little harp figure, and then that leads us into this next section here. And this is sort of an exploration of the fanfare motif, the, the biggest exploration it receives in the symphony by far. So we've got the snare drum laying down the groove, then the trumpets announce the fanfare motif. Again, just like before, the trombones are helping out a little bit with the lower notes, but this is largely a trumpet melody. And then there's this huge sort of orchestral sweep here that happens, and then we're back to the trumpets playing the melody with a little bit of French horn counterpoint here. Uh, then we have that sweep again, but it transitions us into the key of F major. So again, we're switching between A flat major and F major. So now this time the melody is being played by French horns because it's getting a little bit low for the trumpet and I think the color change is really nice. And the trumpet comes back as a soloist along with the trombone to sort of do this counterpoint line um, while the French horn is going away at this fanfare idea. You know, it's funny, I'm going to check on this, but I have a feeling this is a wrong note, and I think I saw it in the trumpets earlier. 
I'm going to check on that, but whether it is or it isn't, um, the score does have some mistakes in it still. It's amazing how you can look at this thing for months and months and still spot mistakes. So after all that adventure stuff happens there, um, it gets a little bit quiet again. And there's a nice little crash there at the Mets of Forte in the pits, so I'm going to check on that. So this is kind of what I've been thinking of as the Joe Hisaishi section, but there are definitely a couple influences happening here. So firstly, there's this alternating key signature, right? 6, 8, and 3, 4. And most people, when they see that, are going to think West Side Story, right? Because you got the America song, right? Da, 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 da. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, and 2, and 3, and... Right? So that's what's happening here. So this is definitely borrowing a little bit from that sort of idea. Although, of course, you know, Leonard Bernstein wasn't the first one to use that sort of alternating time signature. But that's how I know it best and how many people know it best. Um, but the reason I call it the Joe Hisaishi section is because I was even more inspired by his work for Ponyo. Um, not sort of the big operatic um, material, but sort of the quieter stuff, just the pluck strings and the glock. And this section includes both. It's all pit strings down here, um, and then the glockenspiel takes over the melody. And it's just very, very, it's very cute music. It's, it's modest in its own way. The melody is very, very simple. That said, this also capitalizes on another thing that I really enjoy, both listening to in music and writing, and it's just this sort of clockwork idea. Um, I really like implementing moments of sort of clockwork musical stuff. Um, just this, you know, all these sort of interlocking parts and ideas that sort of weave together to create one full tapestry. So yeah, so the simple melody in the glock continues here. There's this very obvious modulation to just the subdominant, right? So we go from F major to B flat, and then just goes back to F major. It barely even counts as a modulation, right? Then this whole passage is sort of given to new instruments. It's given mostly to winds, but the brass kind of helps out, as you're going to see. And there's more percussion stuff happening here, too, than there was before. So it sort of increases the amount of activity, again, sort of leading into my clockwork tendencies, right? The melody is now given to pick and tuba. I really like that pairing of the very, very low and the very, very high. More percussion, we've got wood blocks and tambourine, as well as a snare drum going. Um, eventually, we get some help from trombone, bass trombone, I should say and trumpets, so it all just works together to create this sort of clockwork feel. And then it concludes with a descending chromatic line for pitzes, like when we started the section, and the pits in the lower strings as well, and this nice little chord, and then now immediate modulation to A major. So here we have this huge version of the seafaring melody, right? So it's being played by you know, brass and the horns and the trombone and bass trombone. Um, the strings get it. It's quite high, but hopefully they can play it. There's a couple other things happening too, you know, sort of this woodwind fall, and some of them are just kind of chirping away the whole time. Um, the bassoons and the viola still have... Oh, that's a terrible looking line. Sorry, it just makes everything look terrible. Um, but my point is the bassoons and the viola have that rhythmic motion from earlier, the da 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 right? So there's still some sense of movement happening underneath, even though in the bass there's just whole notes. Um, and speaking of which, the cello has also that one rhythmic idea from earlier as well. Um, there's these trumpet interjections that happen here in triads. Um, so you can think, you know, whoever you like, John Powell, John Williams, lots of composers use this. Um, and because it's because it sounds awesome. That's why they use it. Um, so I interject it here. So when there's space, right? Because here we have a lot of motion in the melody because we've got, you know, these eighth notes and stuff. But here it's just dot a quarter, dot a quarter, dot half. So there's enough space that I can introduce something here without it feeling like there's too much going on. So I, again, I use these trumpets to fill in the space, right? 
And the melody is continuing here. Now instead of sitting on, it's alternating between A major and B minor here. So I want to write this all out. Uh, A and B minor. Oh no, that's supposed to be a B. B minor. It does the same thing here. <laughs> um, just forget that. But here we have D major, which then becomes D minor in this measure. Um, sort of giving it that half diminished two feel, which I love. Um, and a lot of uh, the instruments drop out for the melody. Here the melody is just being carried by the strings, right? Before we had trombones on it and we had horn. Now horn is just doing this other thing. Um, it all comes back in here for the very ending. And it's a lot more resounding here, the melody, because now the trumpets are also joining in in octaves. And then here, this is the lead-in for the B section of the seafaring theme, which is all based around the flat six. And that's because this section is eventually going to modulate to C major. But we're going to stay here for a while before that happens. So the trumpets and trombones are carrying this theme, but there is a counter melody happening in the bassoons and horns. In the digital recording that you're, going, that you're hearing throughout this whole thing, um, I feel like the counter melody is coming out more than this, but I think in a live scenario, the trumpets are really going to help that um, the, the actual theme here sort of um, come out of the whole woodwork rather than you hearing the counterpoint theme so much. There's a lot of stuff happening down here. The violas are chugging away. Got the uh, cellos and the, I should say the celli, I don't know if it matters. The celli and the basses all just sort of you know, doing these very furious sort of arpeggio uh, movements here. Timpani is going as well. This is supposed to be just sort of an exciting moment. I've got, you know, triangle happening and crash cymbals, bass drum, harps, trills, you know, all my favorite sort of excitement uh, elements, you know. So that's all going here. And it continues here as well. And then the material is given to strings. So strings have the melody, and the horns are helping out with that as well. Meanwhile, I'm filling in lots of empty space. You've already heard the melody, so you're familiar with it. So I'm given a little bit more liberty with how much I can mess with um, things around it. So, you know, less than a beat in. The trumpets are doing these triad things again. By the end of the measure, there's all this empty space. We've got the woodwinds up here um, interjecting. Um, the trumpet motion is given to the horns because it gets kind of low for them, and also the color change is nice. The viola has a slightly more involved line now, too, so it's building excitement. You know, the timpani is going even more crazy than before, and there's this descending line, too, happening in the tuba and the bassoon, which almost alludes to a march-like idea, which will be expanded on greatly in the fourth movement, which we'll get to later. So this ends somewhat abruptly here, and again, it gets us the key of C major, and why? It's because we are building off the flat six. So it, and since we spent so long in this sort of flat six territory, um, We've sort of, our ears have grown um, unaccustomed now to the sound of A major, even though that's what we've been in the whole time, technically. So it doesn't feel odd at all when we go to C major. It feels like a very, very natural sort of transition. So it's abrupt because all of a sudden we cut to just a rolling timpani and this double bass note. So it's all of a sudden very quiet, not a lot happening. Two uh, cellos or two celli come in to play these chords, and there's sort of this diminished thing happening here. Um, and then the horn comes in, solo horn, giving us kind of solemn version of the seafaring melody. The bassoon now comes in with, again, another solemn version of the seafaring theme, and then the clarinet pipes in as well to sort of conclude this idea here. Um, at this point, the lower strings are out, we've got the upper strings back in, so the only bass element happening here is just the bassoon, and it's in its relatively higher registers, and it's on the melody, so it doesn't have that sense of weight that this section does. It feels a lot lighter. We've got string harmonics up here to get a nice louder sound. There's almost sort of a chorale happening in the strings, you could almost say.
But then even what little um, musical activity I've built up here immediately goes away as we cut to sing uh, to solo cello. This section is basically a string quintet because you've got your bass just pitzing, not doing really much of note. Um, cello here and then viola, violin one and two, pretty much all soloists. And this is the anticipation theme you may remember. So we are building into sort of um, the freedom theme again, just like we were before. Except this time we're already in C major, so we're not really using this to modulate, which is nice. That fanfare idea that came at the end of the anticipation theme on strings. You don't normally hear fanfares on strings, or not exclusively. But don't worry, I remedy that really quickly, because then it's here on huge brass. Trumpets, horns, trombone, bass trombone, and then the tuba hitting this bass note down here. Very big sound, rolling timpani, um, and it's filling in the empty space too. I was specifically thinking of Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods here. But there's this big fanfare idea of the Into the Woods melody. Um, so I was sort of imitating that general um, grand feel here, because I really like that moment in the musical. So the motion gets even bigger here. The the, the actual fanfare melody now um, is gone, and its place now is all this other uh, swirling activity. And I like the sparkly effects of like the glock and the chimes. There's sort of a hemiola thing happening, right, because we've got the dotted quarter notes because it's 12-8, but then the glocks are just playing normal quarter notes, so it sounds like triplets. Um, so I, I like that effect. There's just lots of... Um, Lots of just effects happening here, just to make it sound big and huge. just simmers down back into these string beds, you know, just like before. So we're back to the freedom theme, and it's presented the exact same as it was before, except instead of the piccolo doing the jig, it's uh, for a violin solo. You see the trumpet gets that melody again. But instead of going straight into a reprise of it um, with the horns and trombone and stuff, after the trumpet finishes up, we get this very amusing sort of jig here. It's a very cheeky moment in the symphony. Because um, it's this goofy woodwind jig, um, and the tuba's blurting out these bass notes, there's a tambourine, it's very silly. But, and it's also doing like the chords from Heart and Soul, um, which is especially cheeky because it's sort of exposing the fact that the freedom theme is almost entirely built off of those chords, just the Heart and Soul chords. Um, so it's just a, kind of a silly moment. But my favorite moment, and one of my favorite moments in the whole symphony actually, um, is this last measure here. Um, Suddenly, almost all the woodwinds drop out, right? Um, the tambourine even sort of drops out a little bit, just playing on sort of the two and four, and then there's this extra thing there. Um, and the brass stuff drops out too. And it's just the piccolo, which continues the melody, completely oblivious to what's just happened. The bassoon, which very shyly and bashfully does this descending chromatic line, um, sort of embarrassed almost that everyone else is gone. And then before they can even finish their sad little ending, um, the timpani interrupts them with this loud booming on the eighth notes, and then it leads right into um, back into the freedom theme. With the jig now going in all the woodwinds, which I think sounds really cool up here. Before I had the seafaring melody in counterpoint, um, but instead now I have this silly little woodwind jig, and I think it works quite nicely actually. And the tambourine is still going, um, so it's it's kind of it's not silly though anymore. It feels joyful because you've got the freedom theme going and the strings happening down here, and the cello and the viola are kind of chopping along now. So there's definitely a sense of movement happening here. And this continues on. Then I drop a lot of the instruments. So we get the counterpoint version of the seafaring theme now in the winds. Um, but it's gotten a lot clearer now because there's a lot less instruments happening. There's arpeggio motion in the violins and the other, the violin, the violin too. Because in violin one, they're also imitating the uh, woodwinds up here. 
it just feels very clear all of a sudden, like you just burst out of a fog or something. I don't know. Um, it doesn't stay that way for long because the jig comes in on the trumpet and on viola here shortly thereafter. Um, Then that's interrupted by harp, and it leads us into this transitional material, which we'll recognize from earlier, sort of the freedom theme B section, but really it's just transitional material. Except now it's um, the strings are taking over, other than this horn counterpoint thing. Um, and all the high string stuff, especially with the diminished chords, makes you think of Randy Newman's uh, film score stuff. Um, it wasn't something I was doing intentionally. I wasn't intentionally trying to emulate him, but that's what this reminds me of. So then we get back into um, the full orchestra again after that's over, and there's lots of things happening here, right? We've got the seafaring theme in the piccolos, the jig happening in most of the other woodwinds, and all the other woodwinds, I should say, um, the horns and all the brass, most of the brass are doing the freedom theme, the tuba's doing the bass notes for the jig, um, all, we've got the tim tambourine back in, timpani's in, um, violin two is helping out the pick with the seafaring counterpoint. This is doing the string bed stuff from earlier, that counterpoint line. And then the violin ones are doing that uh, piccolo and then violin jig um, from earlier that usually would come right before the freedom theme would start. That's a lot of material, and maybe you don't remember where all this came from, but I did my best. Um, but it's just all the stuff kind of happening at once. It's sort of supposed to be a very joyful moment because these are all really happy, joyful themes. Um, so this is supposed to be just a very joyous, optimistic moment. And the symphony as a whole is meant to be very joyful and optimistic, so this moment kind of just gets what the symphony is trying to do. And then we have an immediate modulation at A major to get back into this big version of the seafaring theme. And I want to talk really quickly about that too, because you'll remember before um, when I had this transitional material at the begin near the beginning of the symphony, it was used to transition from C major to A major, because I like these sort of carefully set up key changes. The only thing that I like even more than carefully set up key changes are immediate modulations. So in this case, I got to sort of have my cake and eat it too. I, I did the setup here that I had before. Um, but it's a fake out because we're not modulating, even though I didn't change any of the chords. We're just staying right in C major. So it sort of tricks the listener, keeps them on their toes, and then immediately afterwards, we just directly modulate the key that this was supposed to lead us to to begin with. Um, and I do that pretty often on my pieces. I'll have a carefully set up key change, and then I'll reference that later, but then I'll just end up doing an immediate modulation. Um, I just like to surprise the listener in that way. And... Um, I also just think that once the listener has the modulation in their head already, there's less of a point in doing all the setup. But I still like the setup, so again, I'm having my kicking being it too, right? Um, so this should look familiar because it's a lot like the big version of the seafaring theme that we heard before. Very few changes were made here. I made some changes with the percussion. Um, I think, yeah, the timpani is more involved, chimes are in, um, snare drum is in. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as before. Um, but it feels a lot grander because there's all this percussion activity happening too, in addition to everything else. Then we have the B section coming in again. It's very similar, just with the added percussion. Um, and then there's also this woodwind run that's happening on top, which I think gives it this sense of excitement, or that's what it's supposed to do. I'm using the word excitement a lot. That's because this is supposed to be exciting. <laughs> so this material continues on just as before, but with the additions for this section. And then once again, oh, and that shouldn't be there. That's circled for some reason. Oh, so this is circled because I want to talk about this. Um, so the section's pretty much the same as before, but I've also added all this percussion stuff, including these sort of hemiolas, I guess. I'm hoping that this is, applies. I'm not uh, to what a hemiola is, right? Because it's um, suddenly this triplet motion, right, happening here, which sort of breaks up the time signature a little bit. 
exhibit the sense of variety. It also just might make this whole section very hard to play and to stay together. So if this ends up being a disaster, if it ever gets performed live, maybe this stuff won't stay in. I don't know. But it gives it a sense of variety, and it keeps it from feeling stale, because maybe we've gotten sick of these percussion grooves and hearing this material again, so by injecting this, these new rhythmic ideas, it gives it a little bit more life. Okay, so this continues as before. The only difference is there's now a new measure, which I guess you could call a coda, um, just to give it more of a sense of finality so it's not ending so quick. Um, and then it, this way quiets down for the very, very ending, right? Or it's just these high strings. Got this mark tree going, so it's this nice sparkly effect. Solo cello plays the seafaring theme, with just a fragment of it. And then while this harp is doing its run, solo horn plays the fanfare motif in its entirety, but much softer here, while the chimes play the seafarer theme in sort of rough counterpoint. And then it just ends. Very nice, soft ending. And that's it. That is the whole entire first movement. Hopefully this was interesting or informative or useful or helpful in some way. So I'm going to be doing videos on movements two, three, and four as well. Um, separate videos for each of those. So definitely subscribe if you don't want to miss those. I really enjoyed talking about this. It was a lot of fun. Um, hopefully it wasn't dreadfully boring. And I'm looking forward to discussing the next movements with you all. All right. Thanks so much for watching and for listening.